Hidden away in the green valleys and slopes of the Italian Piedmont is a way of life far removed from the hustle and bustle of Rome or Milan. Northwest Italy is where you'll find some of the country's grandest scenery, and three of Europe's tallest mountain peaks are close to here, including Mount Blanc and the Matterhorn. The people of the Piedmont, which means foot of the mountain, cultivate their fields and vineyards, as did their fathers and forefathers. Their lives follow the rhythm of the seasons. They cherish old customs. It's quite peaceful around a town like Torre Pellici, just the kind of place most people would like to retire to. The mad pace of life in the rest of the world can just rush on by. But what few people know is that here in these pastoral valleys, a spiritual revolution was born. Extraordinary people of faith made a stand here, a stand centuries ahead of their time. They lifted up a dazzling light here amid the ignorance and superstition of the Middle Ages and paid for it with their lives. These beautiful slopes once echoed with the horrible sounds of a slaughter that shocked the world. Today, we begin the incredible story of the Waldenses. It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. Presented by Mark Finley. Two kinds of power. How did the Dark Ages come to an end? How did centuries of superstition and religious oppression give way to the modern world? How was the corrupt medieval church reformed? Historians always point to men like these for the answer, the heroes of the Protestant Reformation. They are honored here in the city of Geneva at the Wall of the Reformers. Men like John Calvin, Martin Luther, and Ulrich Zwingli rediscovered the great truths of the gospel that the Apostle Paul originally championed. They created a spiritual revolution in the early 1500s. Christendom would never be the same again. We've always been taught that the Reformation and the Renaissance made the modern world possible. But what if the gospel was actually rediscovered and championed centuries before Luther and Calvin? What if it happened some 300 years before Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the Wittenberg church door? It sounds impossible, but it's true. Centuries before the invention of the printing press made it possible to circulate the New Testament gospel throughout Europe, another group of people were shaking up the world by passing that story along with handwritten copies and by word of mouth. Here's how it happened. This chapel in Torre Pellici, set in the midst of the Piedmont Valleys, honors the faith of a man who made a life-changing discovery. Peter Waldo discovered the words of Christ, and those words seemed to contradict just about everything he saw in the church around him. His followers would make one of the most inspiring stands in history by basing their lives on Christ's words as found in the Gospels. It all started one Sunday in the French city of Lyon in the year 1175. Peter, a successful merchant, saw a friend drop dead right in front of him. He began to wonder, what if it had been me? What would have become of my soul? So he sought advice from a master of theology in town. This scholar told him about various ways to seek holiness and find salvation. 
But which is the surest way, Peter asked. The scholar then quoted the words of Christ given to the rich young ruler. They're recorded in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 21. If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Those words struck Peter Waldo to the bone. He just had to respond. He hadn't been that scrupulous as a businessman, but now he began to notice all the beggars on the streets of Lyon. Times were hard. A famine was raging. Peter decided to liquidate his assets and give to the poor. And then he began a plan of regular distribution of charity. Others joined his cause and created a society called the Poor of Lyon. But Peter didn't stop there. He kept reading the words of Christ. He kept taking in the gospel. Only Latin translations of scripture were available at the time, so he hired two clerks to translate books of the New Testament into his local dialect. Now he could study the word for himself. Peter Waldo's life was radically changed by the good news that the Apostle Paul championed while in James, the good news that so many of us take for granted. The gospel of grace laid out in the Bible stood in such contrast to so much that the church was doing. Soon the poor of Lyon were preaching the simple gospel all over the south of France. Well, soon enough, a local cleric brought Peter to court. He wanted this unauthorized preaching to stop. But Peter had already caught a glimpse of a grand mission. He had been captured by Christ's words in Matthew, chapter 28 and verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. This was Christ's commission to his disciples, and Peter had become a true disciple. In 1177, Peter and his followers were vanquished from the diocese. Eventually, 8,000 of them were driven into exile, and that's how they ended up here in these isolated mountains and came to be called the Waldenses. But what's really extraordinary is what these people actually preached. They championed Jesus as the one and only mediator. They championed every believer's right to learn the truth from the Bible alone. They championed the right of believers to worship as their consciences dictated. They opposed the whole church tradition of prayers to the saints and rituals to gain merit in indulgences for those in purgatory, all the things that would stifle spirituality for centuries. In other words, the Waldenses proclaimed the great truths that would become central to the Protestant Reformation 300 years later. That's an incredible achievement. Theirs was truly a faith against the odds. Standing in this great landscape that was home to the Waldenses, you wonder, what was their secret? How did the simple gospel become so powerful in their lives? How did they plug into the energy that moved the apostles to turn the world upside down? How can we experience that same power in our day, in our world? To really understand these people's remarkable secret, we need to pay a visit to their first great adversary. Innocent III was crowned Pope at the age of 37, here at a magnificent ceremony at St. Peter's Cathedral in 1198. He was a brilliant aristocrat with a fine legal mind who wanted to reform the church. At first, he showed great promise of doing just that. Innocent III took on corruption in the church hierarchy. There was the concubine issue. At the time, many priests actually paid bishops for the right to keep a concubine. Innocent III banned the practice. He also began inspecting monasteries and convents at a time when many of them had become sources of scandal. This man had all the natural tools to become a great reformer. He had the intelligence and the will and the power. But something happened to this pope on the way to real reformation. This is the Castel Sant'Angelo, the castle of the Holy Angel. It was built by the Emperor Hadrian as his family mausoleum. But in medieval times, it came to be used as a papal fort. Yes, the papacy became a fortress. The chambers of this enormous cylindrical building were once filled with intrigue and betrayal and murder. Pope John X was smothered here. 
Benedict VI was strangled. The Church of Rome, founded on the blood of the martyrs, became a political force caught up in all kinds of wars and plots and counterplots. And Pope Innocent III had a lot to do with that. What is this would-be reformer known for today? He is remembered as the man who put papal power on the map of Europe. No other pope excommunicated as many monarchs as Innocent III. It was his favorite political weapon. He also is remembered for the crusade against the Albigenses. These were people in the south of France who had some pretty strange beliefs about God and the devil battling it out on equal terms. Innocent's fight against heresy turned into one of the bloodiest slaughters in the history of the church. He is also known as the Pope of the disastrous Fourth Crusade. Christian soldiers sent to take back Jerusalem from the Saracens ended up slaughtering other Christians in Constantinople. The city was almost destroyed. And finally, Innocent III is remembered as the father of the Inquisition. He gave the Dominicans the task of rooting out heresy by any means necessary. The man who once ruled here in the Vatican left a legacy that deeply troubles both Protestants and Catholics. And it's a legacy that includes persecution of the Waldensians. It started at the Fourth Lateran Council in Rome in 1215. That's when Innocent III officially condemned the Waldensians. Five years before, a few of these believers from Lombardy had appeared before him, seeking approval for their cause. The Pope was put off by their ragged appearance and he especially disliked what he called the mania several of you manifest for preaching. And so tragically, the Waldensians were caught in Innocent III's bloody crusade against the heretics. It became a reign of terror in the south of France. In just one town, a place called Béziers, 7,000 people rushed into the church of St. Magdalene. They were crazy with fear over the bloodshed around them. But the church provided no refuge. All 7,000 were massacred. Isn't the Third's bloody crusade and his inquisition are what first drove the Waldenses here to these mountains. They had to find a place of refuge. They had to find a place where their faith could stay alive. And here we find one of the great ironies of history. Because Peter Waldo wanted to be a reformer, and Innocent III wanted to be a reformer. What's more, both of these men thought they were following the teachings of Christ. Peter Waldo was a virtuous, charitable man, and Innocent III was regarded in his day as one of the more virtuous popes. There were several before and after him who were much more corrupt. And yet one man felt compelled to destroy the followers of the other. Innocent III became a persecutor, Peter Waldo became a champion of the Reformation 300 years before the Reformation. Let's try to get a closer look at what made the difference. What exactly drove these men in opposite directions? Because this will show us an important key to tapping into the power of the gospel in our own lives. This is part of Peter Waldo's legacy. It's known as the College of the Barbs. Barb is actually a word for uncle in the Piedmont dialect. It was the respectful and affectionate term applied to Waldensian pastors. Here is where they were trained. Dedicated men studied during the winter months for a three to four year period. Many were peasants who worked on farms most of the year. But at the college, they learned to read and write. They studied the Bible, memorizing entire books of the New Testament. And then they were sent out to spread the word.
The remarkable fact is that after Innocent III's bloody persecution, the Waldensians didn't come here to hide. They came here to find a base of operations. They came here to train as missionaries, and these brave souls went out with their knowledge of the New Testament and spread the gospel far and wide. They stopped at a village well here, a fireplace there, and talked about what they had learned in the scriptures. They were doing exactly what the Apostle Paul urged a young pastor named Timothy to do, found in 2 Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. The movement which Peter Waldo started was driven by one thing, spreading the gospel. It was about communicating a personal faith. That's at the heart of the Waldensian story. They had good news to share. Something else motivated the Waldensian's first great adversary, Innocent III. In his very first sermon as Pope, this man focused on why kings and emperors should submit to him as Christ's vicar. His main goal was to extend the church's authority. Innocent III probably thought he could do good by making the church's spiritual power supreme over the temporal power of kings. Listen to the words he spoke here in his first sermon as Pope. He said, The Lord Jesus Christ has set up one ruler over all things as his universal vicar. And as all things in heaven and earth and hell bow the knee to Christ, so should all obey Christ's vicar. No king can rightly reign unless he devoutedly serves Christ's vicar. Innocent III wanted to have authority over kings and emperors. He quoted from the words God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah, found in chapter 1 and verse 10. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. The Pope applied these words to himself. What he seems to have missed was that Jeremiah never wielded any political power. In fact, he was persecuted by his own Jewish rulers. The prophet's only weapon was his moral voice. But in the end, the power part overwhelmed the spiritual part. The Vatican has been engaged in diplomacy with nations around the world for centuries. And in recent years, the popes have worked hard for peace, reconciliation, and justice. Innocent III, however, got caught up in another kind of diplomacy from his seat in St. Peter's. In 1198, Philip, the King of France, refused to submit to the pope's ruling regarding his divorce and remarriage. Philip thought this was none of the pope's business. Innocent III saw this as a clear challenge to the church's authority over temporal rulers. So what did he do? He proclaimed an interdict over the whole of France. That meant that all believers in that country were deprived of the church's sacraments. Back then, no greater calamity could be imagined. Most people believed they had no hope of salvation without their confession to a priest and partaking in the Eucharist. But to punish one man's sin, and to assert his power over a king, Innocent III doomed an entire nation. His pursuit of power extended to the city of Constantinople, now Istanbul. It was there that his fourth crusade ended. It was there that his Christian soldiers of the West slaughtered Christian people of the East. Though protected by this fortress and an army, Innocent III wasn't a barbarian. He was an educated, refined, and even enlightened man for the time that he lived in. And so the atrocities in Constantinople troubled him. After all, didn't Jesus say that we should love our neighbor? Weren't these people brothers and sisters in Christ? Innocent's brilliant mind found a way around the problem. He wrote this to Baldwin, the leader of the crusade. But can we apply the term neighbor to these schismatics who rejected the love of their brethren? In other words, people who had different doctrinal opinions 
couldn't really be considered neighbors. And so Innocent thanked Baldwin as the instrument of God's justice. The Waldensian peasant preachers just didn't have the sophistication to redefine the word neighbor. They were stuck with the plain teachings of the New Testament. And so they regarded just about everyone as their neighbor. After all, when you've got good news to share, everyone is your neighbor. When your main goal is to spread grace around, artificial boundaries tend to disappear. What were the Waldenses doing in 1198? They were spreading good news. The general population back then was pretty ignorant about religious matters. They nodded their heads to the dogma the church passed on, but they had little clue as to the meaning of incarnation and redemption. The Waldenses felt a responsibility to teach people clearly. They were sharing texts like these. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, Titus 2.11. The Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Gospel of the New Testament isn't about shutting people out. It isn't about how hard you can make the entrance requirements into heaven. It's about God shedding his blood, sweat, and tears to give everyone a chance to repent. That's what motivated the Waldenses, who took the word from these mountain valleys to all who were willing to listen. They were too busy sharing the good news to worry about asserting authority over kings. Peter Waldo and Innocent III, two reformers, two vastly different legacies. Peter Waldo's discoveries grew into a movement that enlightened much of Europe with the gospel. Innocent III got sidetracked. He wanted kings to acknowledge his seat of power in this city. He wanted to reign supreme, and he ended up with the blood of thousands on his hands. What made the difference? The kind of power each man pursued. And that's a vital question for each one of us today. What kind of power are we pursuing? What drives us? If we're constantly driven to acquire more, to conquer more, we'll never have enough. If we're caught up in building a fortress for ourselves, in protecting our position, we'll never be secure enough. We need instead to tap into another kind of power, the power of the gospel of the New Testament. And how do we do that best? By sharing it. That's what the Waldenses demonstrated. We absorb the gospel best by communicating it in some way. We hold on to faith by giving it away. We experience grace by spreading it around. That's how the gospel of Jesus, the gospel that Peter and Paul proclaimed can change our world. That's how we can rediscover its original energy. We need something we can give to others, a faith that we can pass on to our families. Have you got a faith that's transferable today? Do you have good news to share? Do you have something to communicate with your neighbor? I invite you to rediscover the gospel of the New Testament. I invite you to take a close look at how grace can fill your life and change you. I invite you to come to Jesus, to open your heart to the gospel and let him so transform you that his love and grace flows out to others. I invite you to send that grace along to the people around you today. Please don't get sidetracked by any other pursuits, by other kinds of power. Don't settle for detours. Get on the highway where people share eternal life. Get on the road that's paved with grace. Would you like to say Jesus? There's one thing that matters in my life, knowing you and sharing your love with people around me. Would you like to do that right now as we pray? Dear Father, we're so grateful for those heroes of the faith who have gone before us. We thank you for their courage and their witness, and we want to follow in their steps and benefit from their legacy. Please help each one of us to make the gospel of Jesus Christ our own today. Help us to know grace and to help others know grace. Make the good news ring in our hearts as we try to express it in some way to our family, friends, and neighbors. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We all want answers to life's questions. We all need comfort and encouragement for our spiritual journeys. We're all looking for hope for the future. We're all together on the same planet with the same basic human needs. 
and God has direction for each of our lives. A good place to start your own spiritual journey is the It Is Written website at www.itiswritten.com. Here you'll find resources to enhance your walk with Christ. Go to the studies page and explore the Bible in three free online Bible studies. View weekly It Is Written programs through streaming online video. Catch up on shows you may have missed in the telecast archive section. View the scriptures used in the current week's program. Print out the script from a show you liked for future reference. Find out about upcoming programs and see when and on what channel It Is Written is airing in your city. Go behind the scenes and get a feel for the It Is Written production process. Be the first to find out when an event with Mark Finley or other live It Is Written programs are coming to your hometown. Get the latest It Is Written ministry news and developments. Learn more about the ministry and read the history of the show that's been impacting our world for God since 1956. It Is Written is a donor-supported nonprofit ministry. On the website, you can sign up to become an It Is Written partner and make a secure online donation to help us fulfill the Great Commission. Visit the It Is Written store and find pages of spiritual resources like videos, DVDs, audio tapes, books, music, Bible studies, and digital media products. Be confident in buying online with our secure ordering system. Have a prayer request? There's a place where you can tell us your concerns. There's so much here for you on the It Is Written website. We encourage you to make it a frequent companion on your spiritual journey. Get connected to the source that can change your world, starting with you. The Shroud of Turin, which is kept in this famous cathedral called San Giovanni, has provoked debate for centuries about what Jesus really did look like. But interestingly enough, back in the Middle Ages, one group of people did claim to know. The Waldenses, as they were called, offered up a picture of who Jesus was as a person, a picture they'd put together from a document most people didn't have access to, a document the church kept locked away. Join us next program as we reveal the secret behind their unforgettable picture of Jesus. May God bless our journey together as we continue our series from Italy, Faith Against the Odds. Thank you for joining us for this series, Faith Against the Odds from Italy. May God's grace flow daily out of your life to others. Until next time, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.